afternoon, everybody. My name is Trudy Paxson. I'm the director of the Preservation Society, and I have the honor of making introductions this morning. And the first a person I want to introduce is Stephen Feinberg, who's the executive director of the Rhode Island Film and TV office. And Steve is going to make a few remarks before our featured guest, Lord Fellows. Um, the reason we wanted Steve to be here is because uh, he does the unceremonious work of laying the groundwork for film production crews to come to, the, to Rhode Island. And he deserves a tremendous debt of gratitude from all of us because it took how many years to get the Gilded Age to Rhode Island? I, I think um, <laughs> when, we, when they first announced, Bob Greenblatt announced to uh, that Julian was going to uh, do a series uh, with the Gilded Age. Uh, I called Bob immediately and I said, you have to come to Newport. And I think that was 10 or 12 years ago. And he said, Steve, it's a little premature. Julian's still working on the Downton Abbey series and potentially a movie, but we'll keep you in mind. And I uh, conspired with Trudy and the uh, Preservation Society to make sure that we had accumulated everything we had to offer to uh, uh, Julian and his team because uh, we always felt that part of the show, the home, would be here in Newport. And uh, we were grateful when they arrived and, and took a, a peek at uh, Newport and then uh, agreed that this was uh, one of the homes for the series that is now on HBO. Yes, I was very thrilled with Newport, actually. Of course, I knew about it because I read quite a lot about the Gilded Age by that time, but um, I've never been here, uh, and I don't think I was aware of how sort of complete the image of the Gilded Age is in the town. I mean, you really do have a sense, of course in New York, there are wonderful buildings that come from the Gilded Age, and there are various clubs and things built by Stanford White and so on, but you don't have the same sense of being in a Gilded Age town that you do here, and we use, uh, Newport, not only for Newport, but also interiors for the palaces of New York, because they were the same designers, they were the same architects who were making those buildings, most of which between sort of 40th and 70th are now dust, uh, except in the cross streets. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the, these are the rooms they lived in, and these are the rooms uh, that they chose to reflect who they were. I always think that's one of the nicest bits. You get such a sense of who they thought they were uh, with these great gilded ballrooms and all the rest of it. Uh, but anyway, I was jolly happy to come here. And in many ways, Marble House, uh, as the creation of Alpha Vanderbilt, is the sort of acme of the whole thing, of the, of the idea of the Gilded Age. I mean, she was an extraordinary character, Alva Smith, as she started out. Uh, and she first of all realized her, her family had been uh, more or less ruined in, in the um, Civil War. And uh, I mean, they still, they were sort of in society. She was kind of presented to the French Empress and that sort of thing. But it was all slightly done on a whistle and a prayer. And her first imperative was to get money. And when she met Willie Kay, and she realized that the money had been supplied and uh, she married him. I, I put it that way round advisedly. I don't think he knew what had hit him, but anyway, he, he went along with it. And then she decided later that actually she wanted a little more than she was getting from Willie Kay and she fell in love with Oliver Belmont uh, and that would go on here with Belcourt, uh, which she would change to suit her own taste. Uh, he'd had, you all know this, but I love it, he had the whole ground floor as a stable and he lived above it. Well, that wasn't going to do for Alva. And she just immediately walked in and the horses were gone. I mean, this was a woman who meant business. Nowadays, of course, she'd be the American ambassador to the UN or something, but that, those were, that, that wasn't available to her. Uh, and so she, she moved on to the stage that was, which was social, the society stage, and dominated it and ran it. She was also a great builder, which I love. I mean, they, they, you know, they were a building generation and they liked to build buildings that reflected 
their own image of themselves, and they, they didn't want little wooden cottages by the sea. They wanted a little Trianon, and so they proceeded to build it. Uh, but she, more than ever, she built a wonderful Gothic palace in New York, alas now entirely destroyed and replaced by an anonymous concrete block. Great loss, actually, to the city. It's a pity people weren't uh, more aware a little earlier. Uh, but, I mean, you can say that in every country, really. Um, and, but then she went on and built Marble House. I mean, as a character, I, I find her very interesting. She ultimately became unsatisfied by just being a social dominatrix. Uh, and she turned her attention to women's rights and women's political rights uh, and, you know, was leading a march down Fifth Avenue for women's suffrage. So you, you can see in that, I think, the modern woman she would have been if the whole thing had taken place a hundred years later, uh, that there are the sort of signs of who she was. Um, but it's quite interesting. She, she sort of became angry with herself about the social side and burnt the only really grand portrait of herself as a great society leader. Uh, a loss, I think. I wish someone had hidden it. But um, anyway, they didn't. Uh, I, I mean, I find all that very interesting. She also, uh, she'd seen friends divorce. Divorce was beginning to happen, but there was a social price to pay. And you were dropped from a great many lists, and this wasn't possible for you and that wasn't possible for you. And Alva looked at this and thought, this is not for me. And so what she did was by arranging the marriage of her daughter Consuelo to the Duke of Marlborough and having a daughter who was a perfectly uh, bona fide duchess, she then gave a huge reception for uh, the Duke and invited, after her divorce, and invited the whole of Newport and they had to struggle with whether they were going to cut her because she was a divorcee, mm. or, or and miss meeting the Duke, or go in the hell with it. And that is what they chose. Mm. So after that, the restrictions really didn't exist much, particularly if you had a strong character, much earlier than in England. I mean, I can remember when divorced people were not allowed in the royal enclosure at Ascot. That was in you know, I was in my sort of late teens, early 20s before that changed. So Europe was quite a long way behind America on that, but that was very largely due to Alpha. That she, she just changed the game. And this was uh, a matriarchal town. This was, I mean, women have always dominated high society and they've always chosen who was in and who was out. Uh, and that, that one bit in Vanity Fair, I always like when Becky asks, the Marquis of Stay to help her get into society. And he says, I'm afraid I cannot help you, my dear. For that, you need the assistance of Lady Stay. <laughs> and, and, and that was true everywhere. But I think Newport was a particularly strong uh, version of it because the men in, in America, the, the male upper classes, unlike the, their European counterparts, still worked for the most part. And they worked in banks and in finance and so on, this and that and the other. Uh, ours largely didn't. They just, you know, their farm manager came and told them what was going on. Uh, and because of that, the men weren't here during the week. Uh, the women would come for the whole two months of the season, but the men went back and forth to New York much more. I mean, of course, none of, none of these things are absolute, but uh, the women were the powers in this town, and they said what went. Uh, and, and so, in a way, I think also for people like Alva and Tessio Ritz and various others, there was a kind of satisfaction in that and a kind of fulfillment. Uh, they were not uh, reduced citizens here, they were the leaders of what was going on in the town. But uh, anyway, I, I think it is a rather extraordinary, rather like Versailles. You know, you go to Versailles, you're suddenly sort of aware of what it was to be an absolute monarch in 1690, you know. Wow! Uh, and, and I think this is a similar expression of a way of thinking and this extraordinary burst of achievement after the end of the war which had taken up America's attention 
and, and that was released, and these extraordinary fortunes from shipping and railways, of course, above all, and then copper and coal and everything else. Uh, and suddenly here was uh, a whole country just limbering up to be a, a, a world power, which they would be within less than a lifetime. They, would, they were coming into the 20th century, which America would dominate. And these were the preparatory years. I find all that absolutely fascinating, actually. Um, so anyway, this that's room, my too, pleasure. This room, room the, the gilded salon. <laughs> But again, we like to think that maybe I'm wrong, but um, the last time that we saw Lord Fellows was in this room. It was a dinner that included discovered Newport. Evan Smith was here, yep. along with Catherine Farrington. Um, it, just, it included several others, and I think we clinched the deal, didn't we? <laughs> in this room, that's the story I tell people. Well, I, I mean, the deal was clinched for me long before. <laughs> right. I, I probably wasn't allowed to say that at the time. <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, I think this is an expression. I mean, here was Alpha sitting with her designers, saying, I mean, well, the chandelier is a little bigger than the contrary. <laughs> I'm not sure there's enough gilt on the ceiling. Uh, I mean, rather extraordinary, really. We must have some questions from... May I, may I just take a yes. moment, too? I want to thank some of the folks that are here who are our partners, who um, we could not do this. It takes quite a team. as as uh, Lord Fellows knows, to make uh, production happen and to then promote it across the globe. Uh, uh, Trudy um, had mentioned uh, Evan Smith, Catherine Farrington, and Francesca over at the Discover Newport. We have Anika from the Commerce Corporation. We have Ev Karen Donovan Boyle from uh, the uh, Newport Chamber. They put together a study that found for every one dollar we've given the tax credit returns $5.44 of economic activity. And this series alone, The Gilded Age, according to David Crockett, the producer, they hired 1,200 people and used uh, 500 local vendors, um, renting, purchasing. So it was quite an economic impact, uh, just for season one alone. And especially everybody knows what it was like during the COVID times when things were quiet and then also during the shoulder season really kept businesses flourishing here in Newport. So I want to just well, mention I that. I'm very pleased to hear that. And I also hope, my fantasy is always with period promise, is that people are tapping out these names on their Wikipedia uh, to see if they really existed. And, and I hope they do because they did. Uh, and I hope they are putting names in and checking out whether or not all the lights of New York were turned on in Park Row, you know, and all of those different things we did. Uh, because I, I, I suppose my fantasy, really, is to make people more aware of who they are and where they've come from and what their great-grandparents were doing that led to where they are now. Well, you know, I, I feel that's important, really, and, and I hope period drama helps that. You brought it to life. I can tell you my assistant Carol didn't know who Bertha Russell is, was, but now when the show came alive, I said, well, there's Bertha Russell. Her head would spin around <laughs> as fast as you could know. Isn't Bertha Russell fashioned after somebody? Well, Bertha, no, Bertha is completely alpha. Uh, I mean, George isn't really Willie Kay. Willie Kay was a more uh, moderate personality. Quite a nice man, actually, but he didn't make any of his own money. It was all inherited. He wasn't a dynamic businessman. He was a generous spender. What he was was actually a very affectionate farmer. And uh, he really fell out with Alva uh, over the Marlborough marriage because he knew that his daughter was not particularly well suited with the Duke of Marlborough or vice versa. Uh, as indeed would prove to be the case. Actually, not all of those gilded marriages were unhappy. I mean, another family down here, uh, the Galettes, is that how you say it? Uh, their daughter married the Duke of Roxburgh uh, in another exchange. A wonderful quote from the Dowager Duchess of Roxburgh saying, there are so many things to consider before a marriage, 
does she like the girl? Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, he certainly liked what was coming with the girl. Uh, but in fact, as it turned out, they were very well suited. They were very happy and they lived long and happy lives. Their only blight was no children. And then after about 12 years, she produced a completely healthy son who went on to be the next duke and the present duke descends from him. So the, the happy endings all run. I mean, you know, some of them, of course, it was odd for the girls, really. I mean, they had to get used to this very different set of values. And I've often thought, as they were sitting there, freezing to death in some castle in Shropshire, they must have longed to be back uh, at, at Rhode Island. But, but you know, uh, that wasn't allowed them. But uh, it was an exchange that worked in some cases, although not exactly really for Consuelo. But the relationship between George and Bertha Russell their marriage seems very strong. So yes, I, I mean, what I, I was always rather taken with was one of the most ruthless of the so-called robber barons of that particular period was Jay Gould, who had a reputation for harshness in business, even among men who were harsh in business. Uh, he was the sort of toughest of them all. And indeed, if you allow for inflation, one of the richest men who's ever lived, um, but, uh, uh, unusually, he was a very affectionate husband and a very loving father and would sort of lead his daughter around the lawn on a pony, you know, and that kind of thing. Which, uh, in, a, in a generation when many fathers hardly knew their young children, and that was considered the business of women and the business of nursemaids and, and at times their mother, but certainly not their father. Uh, and, and I love that contrast. It seemed to me very uh, sort of interesting that the man would reserve all his softness and kindness for his own family uh, and everyone else he was quite happy to cut off at the knees. Uh, and, and so that sorted George Russell. Uh, and, and also I think with the Russells, we forgive them because they are so mutually supportive. Right. They're both very ambitious, and we don't in this generation particularly approve of either of their ambitions, that George wants to be the richest, the most powerful man in the world, and she wants to have New York at her feet. Uh, and, and we would find both of these rather difficult to take. But what makes it, I think, emotionally acceptable is they're embracing each other's ambitions and doing what they can to help the other one. That, that, you know, sort of softens it. Well, at that time, when he would pay money at the, for those booths oh, yes. to get everybody to come to her event, just said, I'm willing to put it all out there for her. I, I love her and care about her so much that I'm doing this not for himself, he was doing it for her. Yes, he was doing it for her. Uh, he was not prepared to see his wife snuffed and right. humiliated. Right. Uh, and it was as simple as that which was the music room uh, of the breakers. Because uh, we, we do have some of the interiors actually which fit in with the main house which is built uh, in a studio. Uh, but every now and then they go through a door and mysteriously appear in the breakers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Hi, Lauren King, Newport this week. Lord Fellows, I'd like to ask you, you, you speak so eloquently about history, you clearly have done so much research, was there ever any temptation to make them his, the true characters, or was there more freedom in making them fictionalized versions? I did at one time in my life explore the possibility of doing a series about the vandals. But um, I think, I mean this is me, I, 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 there's, there's no law, but I feel that if you have real people, you must make them say what they really would have said. And you must make them do what they would have done. And that is quite limiting. When you have fictional people, then you can take events from anyone's lives and, and make that happen. Uh, but you must be, I think, quite tough with yourself about real people. Uh, I don't think, I'm not afraid of the law or anything like that, I don't think. Uh, the kind of stuff I write uh, would make people run for the law courts. But uh, nevertheless, I think 
uh, one, one has a duty to be true. I mean, I do have one or two real characters in Gilded Age, the most prominent being Mrs. Astor and Ward McAllister. And Stanford White, but, but, but Mrs. Astor and Warwick House that we see quite a lot of. But that story in the first series, I don't know if any of you watched it, but in the first series, <laughs> we, we, we have a story where uh, uh, Bertha uh, tricks Mrs. Astor by involving her daughter in a celebratory dance to be performed at her ball. And then when Mrs. Astor refuses to come, cancels the daughter. Uh, and the daughter is then in a terrible state, Carrie Astor weeps and wails, and finally her mother gives in and agrees to attend the ball. This is exactly what happened between Mrs. Astor and Alpha Lamb. She deliberately encouraged Carrie to be part of the dance and then threw her out of it when her mother said she wouldn't come, and Carrie's tears persuaded Mrs. Astor to attend the ball. And after that, Alpha was essentially in New York society. So I felt that was completely justifiable. I wasn't doing anything to Mrs. Astor in the show that wasn't done to the real Mrs. Astor in life. Uh, but that's my sort of rule test, really. Uh, and, and so that's why you need principles who are not real, so that you have that freedom. Paul Parker from the Providence Journal. Uh, did the availability of these wonderful houses and, and locations in Newport change the arc of your story? Uh, and if so, how? Um, I don't know the extent to which it changed the story because it was always designed to be played out in these incredibly opulent interiors, which is the sort of home of the Gilded Age. And I think it was a great relief when we discovered we were going to be able to use the real thing, the real McCoy, as much as we could. I mean, I always remember at the beginning of Downton having, not an argument exactly, but the designers, to, to an extent, uh, were quite keen on inventing the whole house uh, of Downton Abbey. I knew that if we were going to try and invent what that house had to look like, our entire budget would go on the library, <laughs> and, and, and we'd have nothing left. Uh, and so we needed to find a house that was still lived in, still furnished, and all we would have to do is move things around and take out the portraits painted after uh, 1910, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and we found High Clear where the Carnarvons still lived and where it was still furnished, and portraits were on the walls and they were of course members of the Herbert family largely but they became members of the Crawley family without anyone <laughs> actually stating it uh, and, uh, and really the same was true here. These interiors that we have been allowed to use are incredible uh, and they add a kind of luster to the program that we would be the poorer without uh, and so I think we you know, we very much benefited from that. But then, you know, there's a pleasure in, in showing these houses, these rooms, this town, to the American public and those of them who haven't been here, uh, and letting them know it exists. So uh, all of that, I think, is sort of win-win, really. And, uh, and we have to give kudos to the Preservation Society for really keeping these places uh, uh, beautiful, intact, um, we were just told that uh, they had discovered um, as they were cleaning that there was another area that had been uh, revealed in the room behind us um, as they were uh, preserving everything. And uh, we find, I mean, after the war, that was those were the perilous years. And uh, you know, we know the Elms, for one example, was three weeks away from the demolition ball. One of the best houses in the collection of houses. Uh, and I mean, I think it is so marvelous. That, of course, some wonderful houses were lost. We right. mustn't forget that, and they wouldn't be lost today. But so many were saved. Uh, and I, I think it is a miracle. I mean, we, we, who is the woman who really started the ball road? Catherine Warren. Catherine Warren. And then Doris Duke. I mean, they, these women 
really got the show on the road after the war, uh, and a lot of houses were damaged, uh, unless they were privately owned by people who were terribly rich. Uh, not that I have anything against that, <laughs> but there's a limit to their number. Uh, and, uh, and you know, these houses have been saved even in the absence of their millionaire owners. Right, right. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Right? I'm more of a party from the Boston Herald. So I'm curious, I understand that plot, character, and meaning drive where you choose location. I'm curious how this location and maybe this room's main driven your creativity for your characters and your plot. Was there anything you discovered or felt or realized around Newport that led you to a certain plot line or character development? I don't know that I could really pin one down in that way, although certainly incidents from the life of Alfred Vanderbilt uh, and Jay Gould and uh, Tessie Ulrichs and Mary Fish uh, have found their way into the show. But I think it's more a sort of baptism by immersion, that you, you have such a sense of what these people wanted. Funny enough, a room I found rather moving here in this house is if you go up the main staircase here, on the mezzanine, are these two little rooms that, oh, well, little, that are not particularly big uh, and, and not particularly high ceilings. And they were the private sitting room and the library of Willie, uh, Willie Kay on one side and of Alva on the other. And I did have a tremendous sense of the woman being there, sitting there, going through her diary, talking to her cook, talking to her housekeeper, giving her orders to her maid, a sort of the works of this life, rather than the performance display. I mean, I think being uh, a Gilded Age hostess was a performance art, there's no doubt about that, but I, I had such a sense of the mechanics of it in that room that I found rather moving, really, as I say, that her ambition uh, was coming true. I mean, I love the thing, because I think her son, Harold, someone said of her, she was always happy next to a bucket of cement, and, and she, she loved the whole process of creation and building, and to, to some extent, lost interest a bit when the house was finished, and of course, you know, we all have those friends who buy apartments and sweat over every inch of curtain or carpet or this, that, or the other, and then it's done, and they're very happy for about a year, and then they're ready to move on. And I think I would have that. I mean, actually, uh, I don't know Belcourt, but I would be amazed if Belcourt was a nicer house than this. But she sort of lost interest in Marble House in, in, and went for Belcourt. We do know that this was her 39th birthday present from her husband. Yes, and she had, I did not get that for my birthday. She had the opportunity of working with Richard Morris Hunt, the preeminent architect of the world. And in his diaries, he indicates that she was in charge. It was not Richard, it was Alma. Well, I think with Alpha, uh, the thing was, she knew what she wanted, but an architect could make it stand up. And that was his job, to make her ideas work. Uh, I speak as a man married to a woman who is identical. <laughs> and, uh, only hires architects in order to make her ideas stand up. But uh, you know, she was, Alba was very imaginative and uh, she sort of was partly inventing the Gilded Age, really, as it went along. And others were taking her lead. I mean, I think that's the other reason they couldn't get rid of her when she divorced, because she was really their spiritual leader in so many ways. A part of extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary woman, really. You know, one location that, might, that came to mind that might have drawn you, that you might not have seen, I know what you did on the trip, was when we uh, brought you to the Tennis Hall of Fame and the grass courts and how that had been preserved. And I think that might have helped drive uh, a new part of the story. Well, I loved, um, yes, but I'm sorry about my shaking hand. Uh, Emma always has explained it. Uh, and um, uh, the thing is, I'm neither terrified nor drunk. <laughs> it's, uh, it, 
is that I have something very annoyingly called an essential tremor. It's not at all essential when you've got it, I can tell you. <laughs> but um, I just have to go through life throwing wine down my front and uh, <laughs> a coffee all over the table. I remember I was at a dinner in New York, sitting opposite the woman who directed Lion King. Uh, and we were talking about, what's her name? Uh, Anyway, very nice. And, um, and suddenly in the middle of dinner, I went, and just threw my wine all over myself. And there was a pause. And she said, one. That's right. And she said, um, Do you often do that? <laughs> I love that. Um, but anyway, yes, I mean, I, there are certainly, I mean, I, I think locations prompt you in the sense of thinking, Oh, I must use this. Uh, and I did certainly when I was taken to the casino. I thought we must use this. This is a marvelous survival. How the casino survived the 60s and 70s without being redeveloped or something or other, I can't imagine. They must have had a real champion protecting it. But, um, I mean, that was an example. And I thought, yes, we must use this. And I, I think to an extent, going around the breakers. Didn't Bob Shaw, your production designer, steal a lot of ideas for the set in New York? Sorry, what was that? Didn't Bob Shaw, your production well, designer? Bob, Bob was extraordinary because he knew that we, we wouldn't build a ballroom in the build mm -hmm. because we wouldn't get enough mileage out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had to find the ballroom and we found the music room in, in the breakers, which was a marvellous ballroom. And he took items of the decoration of the breakers and of that ballroom and put them into the artificial build. So the dining room, for instance, has the columns of the music room uh, in it, so that the ceiling divisions uh, and the ceiling painting, the painting's not identical, but the setting of the painting is identical to the music room. So it looks like the ballroom of the house they've been walking through. I love all that, I love the sort of, I remember my father was nothing to do with business at all, but he loved the fact that be sitting in a room like this, then you'd walk out of the door, turn around, and it was all just plastic and cardboard and everything hammered together. Uh, the sort of complete illusion of everything. Uh, I always find very satisfactory, really. But I, I think that was the answer. I mean, I just, seeing these opportunities, you, you do make a sort of mental note to use them and take advantage of them. I'm from Rhode Island Monthly Magazine. Do you have a particular house or room here in Newport that you're partial to, that you just love to spend time in? Uh, my house here is the Elms. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I love the whole thing. The entrance, the disposition of the rooms, the dining room, the ballroom, I think is one of the prettiest in the town. And although, of course, the ballroom uh, at Rosecliff is fantastic, uh, nevertheless, it requires a fantastic ball, uh, and, and uh, I think the, the ballroom at the Elms, I think, is a little more manageable for the kind of entertainment I would be lining up. Uh, and I just love it. I love the terrace at the back, I love the garden, and I was very, very keen uh, that we would use it uh, in the second series, and so we have. But, um, well, we've used quite pretty well all the houses again, one by one. Um, but that, in the old sense, I, I love it. I, lo I also love the fact that the Belcourt ser servants, not Belcourt, what was their surname? The, 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 the Bowen. Uh, their servants went on strike once. I love that. They said they were overused, they didn't have enough time off, and the whole thing was a nightmare. And they all marched out. Whereupon Bowen, who was more than a match, of course, fired them all and hired a whole new set. And his argument was they did have to work all the time. They didn't have enough time off, but it was only two months. And they were being paid very highly for the two months. So both sides felt very morally indignant. But I love that. There's a Sounds quite like a good, good storyline for a future I know. episode. Don't, don't tempt me. <laughs> we have HBO here. We can't reveal it. No, 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 nothing's revealed. Well, didn't you get a memo from HBO no. before you arrived? I did. Yes, what did it say? No plot. <laughs> Do not talk. No plot conversation. We have one more question. Good morning, Lord Fellows. Uh, Zane Wolfgang with the Newport Daily News. Um, 
students here. Uh, I have to confess that my mom was my chief research researcher on this assignment. She is a big fan of both Downton Abbey and The Gilded Age, and she informed me that there was maybe a nebulous or a tenuous connection to Newport in the plot of Downton Abbey. And I was wondering if you could uh, provide some exposition on that. Well, there isn't really a connection in that way, but um, Cora is a Gilded Age princess, uh, Lady Grantham. Uh, from the 1890s. She married Robert Grantham in about 1890, we think, and Mary was born in about 1892, and that's the sort of age range we've been working on. And uh, what we, we feel, what is her main name? Um, her, uh, her father was Jewish, but her mother was not. And um, what I was going on was uh, those heiresses at that time who were not really in society in New York or in Boston or in New Orleans or in any of these cities. Their, their fathers were very, very, very rich and had made great fortunes, but they weren't particularly received in the top society of that town in America. Uh, and they would come to Europe and buy themselves a nice earl or viscount or duke or whatever, usually in either London or Paris. Uh, and then they would go back to Cincinnati as the Countess of Denby or whatever. Uh, and of course, then they would be received. And in my mind, this is the process that Cora went through with her mother arriving in England to find her an heir uh, to whom she would transfer a great deal of money. Uh, and that is exactly what happened. Uh, because I didn't want Cora to be a sort of American aristocrat. So I felt that was a less interesting provenance than her coming from one of these new families and not being conditioned in that way. Because the, the, the old American families uh, who descended from the sort of gentry of the early settlers, and they, they had fairly European viewpoints and philosophies. It was really the, the Gilded Age families that shook up American society and made it American and not a sort of pastiche of European, uh, and that, I felt, was more interesting, because then you could have Cora, as a mother, being sort of at odds with some of the values she is being expected to maintain, uh, and that was rather played out in, in the series. And of course, sometimes she is looked down on by her daughters, because they, particularly Mary, who is rather snobbish uh, and, and selfish, she regards her mother as not being quite the thing. And, and so, uh, you know, you get, with those differences, you, you deliberately get a kind of um, complex, more complex relationships that make it more interesting, I hope. But, but that would be the link, because uh, there's every chance that Cora's parents would have had a house in Newport. And certainly, as a girl, she would have come to Newport. There's no doubt about that. Uh, how she got on here, of course, history has yet to relate. Mm -hmm. We have time for one or two more questions. And I want to ask Melanie to ask a question that she wanted me to ask him. Okay? Hi, so my name is Anika Kimball Huntley, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for the State of Rhode Island. So the first thing that I wanted to do was thank you for all that you've done to bring tourism here to the state as well as to Newport. Um, and the second thing that I wanted to thank you for was the creation of the character Peggy Scott because I do believe that in the period age, there's not a lot of uh, emphasis or even recognition of African-American elite. So I wanted, I wanted to thank you for that. Um, but my question is around your executive producer, Sally Richardson Whitfield, and how you, you know, were introduced to her, and exactly what do you believe has been the biggest contribution she's made to the show? Um, Great question. I have the Scott family. In, I mean, as, uh, as we were saying, this has been quite a long time in its gestation, uh, and because of Downton and those other So I was thinking about it for quite a long time, uh, and I was very keen on two elements. Uh, one is I, I didn't want the show to look like an English period of drama. I wanted it to look different. Uh, and uh, the African-American community gave me that, because in England, it wasn't very numerous uh, before the Second World War, but it was in America for all sorts of different reasons 
that we're familiar with. But also, I felt the show started in 1882, which is, you know, what, 14 years or something after the end of slavery. It would be wrong not to have some reference point to that event in American history, how America is adapting to it, the changes that were being made, uh, and, and all of that. Uh, and I felt it would be uh, wrong not to have that in the show. But how to have it, while I was telling my usual tales of footman and ambition and all the rest of it, uh, was a puzzle to me. And then I came across this book uh, called Black Gotham. I don't know if you've read it by someone called Carla Peterson. And she is essentially, in the book, tracing her own ancestry and telling the story of her own family. But in so doing, she is telling the story of um, the kind of black middle class, uh, upper middle class, in New York in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, a much larger group than I have been aware of uh, and more successful. Uh, based actually not in Harlem, that was a post First World War phenomenon, uh, based in Brooklyn, largely. I mean, not absolute, one always talks in absolute, nothing is absolute, but, but you know, more or less based in Brooklyn. Uh, and um, they had spotted various gaps in the market, and rather like in England, when uh, a, a large amount of Indians and Pakistanis arrived in the early and middle 60s. For different reasons, they were thrown out of Uganda by the army, and various other things happened. And this big um, community arrived, and they realized if you were hungry and you were British and you hadn't got any food in the cupboard and it was after five o'clock, you'd have it. There was no late shopping. And they opened late shops, late food shops on every corner in London, completely transformed London's way of living and, and, and shopping and everything else. Well, the African-American community found several of those, and one of them was drugstores, that in New York was undersupplied with drugstores, and her own family had uh, eventually achieved a chain of drugstores. Uh, and so I lifted that for Arthur Scott, because I wanted some, because I knew some uh, critics would say, oh, come off it, this, you know, here is this prosperous family, are you really telling me to and I wanted to have an ironclad basis for the story. Uh, and indeed, so it proved that the critics did say that the historians came in and said, no, this is absolutely right. Uh, and so um, uh, that, was, that was how it came about. Uh, but I also wanted Peggy to be um, an achiever. I didn't, I, I didn't, I mean, it's a difficult balance because uh, there, of course there was still racism everywhere you looked. And uh, I tried not to be sentimental uh, or dishonest. So we had reminders of what people were having to put up with. Uh, and the scene, you know, she's walking down the street with her father and then the white couple just expect them to stop and get out of the way. I mean, that kind of thing was happening all the time. And people had to put up with it. And, uh, you know, that I found uh, moving, actually, rather moving, that they, they were fighting through this mud uh, all the time. But some people did achieve, and there were women writers, there were women novelists, uh, African-American novelists, I mean, who were publishing. Uh, and so that, for me, was a, a sort of inspiration for her character, really. Can I ask, how did um, bringing her on um, as a partner, as a, a co-writer, as an executive producer, I think that was one of your questions, and you got Sally, how did that um, evolve? Well, Sally came on as a director, uh, and of course had uh, a word on the script, but my co-writer is called Sonia Warfield, uh, and she has been immensely helpful to me. Uh, because uh, she's everything I'm not. I mean, yes, African-American, but she's also a woman, and she's also American. And so she will say, you know, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't say this. You know, they would. And I don't, I don't want you to think she writes the Scott story and I do Agnes and Aiden. It doesn't work like that. 
we do alternate episodes, and then we give notes to each other on the two, uh, and then I'm allowed a sort of last skim uh, before it's handed in to the producers. But Sonia has been fantastically helpful to me, uh, and she and uh, Erica are um, historian on the show, Erica Dunbar, uh, and they will make suggestions. And I, you know, I like to have all through the series, no detail. Um, <laughs> I like to have real events, real historic events that people can type into Wikipedia, and it did happen, and it did exist. Uh, and they've been very useful in coming up with some of those events. So, you know, all shows are collaborative affair, but um, Eric has certainly been a terrific <coughs> help to me. Do you have moments where you might use a, or one, either you or uh, one of the writers uh, might use a modern phrase and then you quickly have to catch it and say, they wouldn't say that at this time? Yes, I mean, I do. Um, I try to get rid of something that wouldn't have been said. Uh, it's a slightly tricky area because yeah. sometimes things would have been said, but they sound too modern. Right. Uh, and uh, you have to decide, do I want people to question this so that I can say, no, it wasn't <laughs> uh, or, or is it the distraction? I mean, I remember reading the Eustace Starks, you know, the, the novel by Troll, uh, which was written, I forget now, but in about 1863 or something. Uh, and there's a moment when someone says something to Lizzie Eustace, the heroine, uh, and she says, huh, tell that to the Marines. And as I read it, I thought that sounds like a Second World War right. say, but it wasn't. And so, uh, you know, something, I mean, there are words, for instance, in a script recently, I took out the word community, because it sounds more, even though technically it is, but because we're always banging on about the community, uh, it, it, it seems like a modern thing to say. So, um, you know, it's, it's a sort of judgment thing rather than an absolute ruling. Right, okay, I'm curious. Do one last question. Welcome to the Adam Director of Museum Experience here at the Preservation Society. And we are premiering a new tour this Friday, and it's going to run every Friday through September 23rd. That is called Inside the Gilded Age. And so we are taking guests on a minibus, and we're bringing them to four of the mansions where we actually filmed, what well, you actually filmed the show and giving them the behind the scenes um, of the filming. And so we were hoping you might share some fun tidbits or stories of the filming process that with your blessing we could share with people. Oh, it's such a nice idea. I love that. Uh, How and it goes to the Newport mansions. That I just write stories. I mean, people always say, what happened on the set? It was really hilarious, you know. <laughs> you sit there so through take 11. Um, that, um, I don't know that I've got anything really um, to tell of funny stories on the set. I mean, how disappointing I feel. No, but well, I we have been, you until Friday, I, I so we'll give you time to think about it. And there was something I found very interesting. Because of COVID, everyone was wearing a mask. So even in rehearsal, they'd have their masks on. And then just when the cameras are going to roll, masks come off. And it was so unusual. COVID filming is in itself a, a, a sort of extraordinary area. I mean, we have masks, that's just the beginning of it. We had masks, we had visors, we had colored bracelets. If you had a green bracelet, you could go, no, if you had a yellow bracelet, you could go onto the set, but you couldn't talk to anyone. But if you had a green bracelet, you could go onto the set and you could talk to the actors. But to talk to the actors, you have to have not only a mask, but also a visor. So you came on like a sort of Dalek. Uh, and, and when they had taken their masks off in order to do the scene, then everyone was on in terror, you know. But we, we, we didn't actually lose any actors. We've lost more actors from COVID this year, uh, having to rejig the schedules and things. And then they were also partitioned. So the actors, Christine Baranski, would be in almost her own bubble. And she was telling a story about how she slipped little pieces of chocolate to Meryl Streep's daughter because Meryl Streep's daughter was afraid of it. 
So she tried to befriend her, but it had to be like, like as if they were in some kind of prison, slipping chocolates underneath the, the plastic. I, yes, I didn't think uh, that she was afraid. Well, that's what she said. That's what Meryl Streep told Christine Durian. <laughs> I think she just had her measure. Right, right. That is, they, they sat in these, but the whole thing was off, because even if it went off, when we went back to the hotel, we were asked not to go out, not to look up our friends in New York, uh, to go straight back to the hotel, not to go into the dining room, uh, and I saw the lady in waiting, you know, would uh, bring me a takeaway Chinese, and I'd sit in front of my computer, usually watching a black and white film with Lana Turner, uh, and then go to bed. And that was it. And then up in the morning, straight into the car. I mean, it, the, the bridge and the, the, the testing that went yes. on three times a week for me, that makeup every day, um, and catering every day, I mean, all of that was quite extraordinary. And even the 100 extras that were in the ballroom, where they were locally hired, people, they normally go home, but because of COVID, they put them up in the hotels for five or six nights, so it was inconvenient for the locals, but very good for our local hotels. I know this is true about Lord Fellows, because we had the we had asked him if he would like to see uh, some behind the scenes areas of the breakers. And we were going to treat him to a very quick, quick lunch because of COVID. We picked him up at 10, and I dropped him off at his hotel at 6. And I learned that that was because he was so bored <laughs> sitting in a hotel that driving around with Trudy Cox was better. <laughs> so I had a wonderful life. So COVID really did me a great favor. Yeah, she, she's rather underselling herself, right? <laughs> um, no, I, was, I loved all that. And of course, seeing the servants' court. Yes. which is roughly has enough bedrooms for a, for a platoon. I mean, quite extraordinary, really. What you do with those rooms now is so difficult, isn't it, really? I mean, you, you decorate a couple. We're going to hire you to decide what we should do with those rooms. Yes, I mean, we need a producer like you. Things like a, a, a servant sitting room or something is quite interesting. But then, once you've done two bedrooms, you've done it, really. And there are 39 servants' rooms. 39. And there are all the outside staff living up elsewhere. Quite amazing, really. I have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Right. Yeah. One, one last one. Thank you. Lord Father, I'm backing off of Nika. My name is Diane Kilgore from She's the People News. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, piggybacking off of Anika. I'd like to understand the cultural shift between the homosexuals that you represent in both Downton Abbey and in uh, Gilded Age, and, and the crossover identity of Ward McAllister, who seems to be getting away with both the crossover, sides. Sorry, the crossover. Well, Ward McAllister seems to be a married man, and then they say, oh, I, but I'd be as safe as Brandy with him. Well, so, before what's Ward McAllister, going on? Uh, I, we never say. <laughs> anything about Ward McAllister. I mean, I have my suspicions that uh, we're, we're not going to give him a storyline that would not be justified by everything we know officially. Uh, I, I usually have a gay storyline uh, because, uh, you know, a great many people are gay and there is absolutely no reason to believe that the percentage of people who were gay in 1890 or 1750 or 1640 was any different from the percentage now. The difference is the tolerance or lack of it in the societies that we're dealing with and how people manage. Uh, and uh, for them, uh, in those societies, being gay was something, you know, sometimes people suspected, I mean, they were aware of it. Uh, but um, it wasn't something that could be played out in public at all. And for most people who wanted to enter society properly uh, and be a uh, power in, in that land, uh, they would get married and they would live a sort of hopefully friendly uh, marriage that for one reason or another was acceptable. I mean, I don't think everyone was miserable because I don't think 
any situation, everyone is miserable, but it was clearly unsatisfactory. Uh, but that, you didn't have an option. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that, I think, is quite interesting for people to see how, in that society, how would they have dealt with it? Would they have been like the very few, very brave men and women who did live publicly, like the ladies of Llangollen, or one or two other more famous ones, where they thought the hell with it. We're going to, this is who I am, and this is how I'm going to live. But you have to be very courageous for that, and you also have to be prepared to live essentially in isolation. Uh, and you know how, how many of us are, are that brave? I, I don't know. Uh, but that seems to me an interesting predicament to explore dramatically, uh, because it's a, a substantial group. I mean, of course, there are other things you could be exploring, but I think when you get into sort of drug taking, then you're going into a slightly different area. Being homosexual or not is something that you're born. It's like being left-footed. Uh, and uh, the idea that you can correct it, I mean, when I was young, they were still trying to correct being left-handed. Yeah. Uh, and you were still being taught to, 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 to be, to be right-handed when you weren't. Uh, I mean, it seems bizarre to think this is still within living memory, but certainly uh, that was the case with homosexuality. There was therapies and that sort of thing. Uh, and you sat and you had an electric shock if you looked at Rock Hansen, but then you looked at Marilyn Monroe and lovely things happened. Uh, uh, I mean, it all seems so naive to us now. But uh, it seems to me interesting to explore dramatically, really. I mean, I don't have a better answer than that. I have to say one more thing, and we talked about this last time, that it's amazing to me the outstanding drama that you created that has, that's a hit, that has a, uh, an audience that is totally immersed in the show, and yet there's no gratuitous sex, there's no violence, there's no swearing, and yet because of your devotion to these characters and storylines and uh, uh, accuracy with history, You've created this great drama, and I, I, I am always in awe of that. And I want to congratulate you. I don't want to say anything to dissuade you from that. Um, but no, I think I've been very lucky to get away with it. Really. It's, and it's to me. add even more to the, that whole commendation, just imagine that you've now seen this man in action every single episode of Downton Abbey was written by one person, Julian Fellows. That's not just one plot, that's plot, many, many, many subplots. It's extraordinary what comes out of your mind. Really. Oh. We're so delighted to have you here in Newport, Lord Fellows, and we hope that you are successful for five or six or seven more seasons. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I am. Okay, well, I didn't dance. No, and he was.